All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy again. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want us to look at uh, verse 1 and verse 2 as we uh, continue the message that we started this morning, 35 reasons why we are in the mess that we are in. 35 reasons that we are in the mess that we are in. And we covered 18 of those this morning. And so we want to hook this thing back up uh, this afternoon. But notice again what Paul is saying here to his young preacher. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Father, thank you so much again for the reading of your precious word. And as we look at it for just a few moments, I pray that you will bless it and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I do not believe that I need to go back and review those 18 things that we talked about this morning, but I do want to remind you that as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, these two verses of Scripture, Paul was trying to encourage his young preacher to let him know that there would come a time that people would walk away from the faith. I believe that we're living in those days now. There are more and more people walking away from the faith. The church is seemingly dying right before our very eyes. But praise God for the remnant. There will be a remnant. Amen. God's always used the remnant. But as we bring this thing to a close this evening, looking at these last 17 things, I want you to remember that we covered 18 in, verse, uh, in this verse of Scripture it says that in the last days there'll be those that give heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Now, whenever we got to the 18th thing this morning, we talked about how that 69% of all of those going to church believe that everybody is going to go to heaven. Now, I want you to know that God wants everybody to go. I believe that with all of my heart. I really do. Uh, the Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all men come to repentance. But the sad truth is everyone won't come to repentance. Everyone won't accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. you got to understand that even when the Lord Jesus walked this earth, that there were those that rejected him, those that uh, just pushed him away. And friend, they continue to do that today. But I want you to know, and I remind you again, that to make heaven your home, you've got to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. My old granddaddy, who used to preach this gospel a long time ago, he died and left this world when I was about three or four years old. My old granddaddy had a sermon in his little book that I had. I gave it to my son, David, but I had that thing, and I never preached one of his sermons, but... I had his sermons, and I looked through some of his sermons, and one of his sermons was titled, Have You Got Your Ticket Punched? Now, and he, and he worked that up from the perspective of riding an old train. You know, they used to go by and they'd punch your ticket. And he said, have you got your ticket punched? Friend, to have your ticket punched, you've got to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our ticket to heaven. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But now as we continue this uh, a series that we're trying to bring to you in two sermons, uh, I want you to know that number, uh, number 18 was 69% of the church goers, but number 19, uh, listen to me, whenever I begin to tell you this, you're not going to believe me, but do you know that half of the people in the United States of America has never read the Bible? Half of the people in this country has never picked up a Bible and never read a Bible. How sad that is that only half of all Americans read their Bibles. Now friend, I'm going to tell you something. We're living in one of the most uh, prestigious times in our history. 
I want you to know that there is more literature about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there, there, there's more of that than ever be, there's ever been in the history of the world. I mean, if you come to my house, I got Bibles everywhere. You know, a lot of men collect guns. Some men collect, collect knives. You know what I collect? I collect Bibles. I got more Bibles. I got enough Bibles. I could probably give everybody in this church a Bible. That's how many Bibles I've got. I collect Bibles. But now, but you know, as I begin to think about this, it burdens my heart to the reason that we find ourselves in the mess that we're in today is nobody's following directions. This is our book of directions. This is the book that God has given us to lead our lives, to guard our lives, and to direct our lives. My goodness, there's more people strung out on prescription medication today than ever before in the history of the world. Always looking for a quick fix for something that's going on in their lives and how sad that is. I want you to know that there is a fix for everything that you'll ever face in this life found written in the pages of this precious book right here. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to criticize anybody for, for taking their medication. I, I'm not against doctors. I believe God uses doctors. I believe God uses nurses. But let me tell you something. I believe that there's a fix for everything. Some of these things that's going on uh, with, with all of these mass shootings and all of these things that's going on and that's messing up our country even more and more, they'll say that people's not mentally stable. You know why they're not mentally stable? Because they haven't read the book that'll give you some mental stability. This book right here will give you some mental stability. It'll make you right with God. And it'll make you right with other people. Only half the people in the United States of America ever picked their Bibles up. I hate to tell you this, but I wonder how many of you have got a Bible. Anybody in here got a Bible? How many of you got Bibles in your house? Everybody in here has got their hand up. Now, I wonder if I were to ask you, and I'm not going, well, I'm going to ask you, but I'm not going to put you on the spot because I don't want to embarrass anybody. How many of you pick them up every day? Well, there's a, there's a few raise their hands. But you see, I dare say that, that do you realize that most Christian people, most people that call themselves Christian in this country, do you know that most people that call themselves Christians in this country, the only time they handle the Word of God is on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and maybe Wednesday night if they attend church on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Sad. I used to get, and, and y'all have heard me say it before, I used to get tickled at Brother John. Oh, Brother John, me and him be walking down the sidewalks in Tifton. Brother John, he kind of had a funny walk. He, that's a Baptist call. That's a Baptist call. That's a Baptist call. That thing was about to throw me down. Y'all know that? That's a Baptist call. And I finally said, Brother John, how in the world do you know that those are Baptist cars? He said, because the Bible's laying in the dash with the Sunday school quarterly stuck in it. And back in those days, we had to fill out paperwork that said, I read my Bible every day. And this is what Brother John said. He said, all them folks going to tell us they read their Bible every day. Whenever we get on it. Lie, lie, lie. Because <laughs> the Bible says, listen, it's sad. But we need to pick up the Bible and read. And listen, some people say, well, preacher, you don't understand. I just don't like to read. Well, do you know that on these things they call smartphones? Amen. And if you don't know how to use yours, just call your grand youngins. They'll teach you how to use it. You can mash one little button. And do you know that thing will read the Bible to you? And if you don't have one of them, just go to a bookstore somewhere and buy you some CDs. I guess they still got CD players. I mean, you can find them every now and then. You can, you can hear the Word of God if you don't want to read the Word of God. You can hear it. Somebody will read it to you. Get some Bible instilled into your heart. Now, as we begin to think about this, half of Americans never reading Bibles. So the next thing that I want you to see is that uh, number 20, listen, 70% of those attending church one or more times a month never share faith 
with a stranger. 70%. 70% never share faith with a stranger. Never share their faith with a stranger. That's sad. I remember a time when we'd share our faith with any and everybody that we come into contact with. But now we're worried about offending someone. Oh, I, I, I can't do that, preacher. They, they'll take offense at me. So what? All they can do is say, I don't want to hear it. I've walked up onto the porch many times of, of individuals that I didn't know and knocked on those doors and, and, and had them to, what I mean, sick to dog on me. I had a hard time out running that dog back to my truck. I did. But I made it back to my truck. And you know what I did whenever I got in my truck? I dusted my feet and I left. But I tried. Uh, I, I remember a young man that, uh, and I've told you about it, Martin and I was sitting and eating one evening and this fellow walked up to my table and asked me if I was Danny Ray. I said, well, I think I am. And uh, he said, well, I owe you an apology. I said, what do you owe me an apology for? He said, you visited my home back in the 1980s. You tried to tell me about Jesus. And he said, I cussed you out. He said, I just cussed you out and run you off of my place. And he said, I want to apologize for that. I said, well, son, I, I don't even remember when that happened. I said, you don't owe me no apology. He said, well, I feel better now that I've apologized. He said, I want you to know I got saved. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> got saved. Let me tell you, that's what Jesus will do. He'll make a difference in your life. Tell somebody about Jesus. Tell a, tell a stranger about Jesus. You never know who might believe. Listen, I've got run off of people's porches with guns before. When I was doing hospice chapel, see, I had a fellow to show me his and tell me to get off his porch. Didn't take me long to get off either. But let me tell you something else. It wasn't but about three weeks later that he called me, or a month later that he called me and asked me to come back. And I led him to the Lord with his Bible. Amen. With his Bible. You see, tell somebody about Jesus. Number 21, listen to this. One in four evangelicals are not certain uh, that the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ was really a historical true event. Now I want to tell you something. That's sad right there, my friend. That's, sad. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Whenever people will not believe this sacred book and they deny the very resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, I tell you what, we're in trouble. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, friends, we're in trouble. Because if He didn't get up, we're not going to get up. But because He got up, glory to God, I'm going to get up. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe that. But it's sad that we're living in a time when one in four evangelical Christians will tell you that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ didn't really happen. Mm. Number 22. Listen to this. 51% of U.S. church goers say that they've never heard about the term the Great Commission. Anybody in here ever heard the Great Commission? Isn't it sad that 51%, that's more than half of the United States of America, Half of the United States of America's church goers say that they've never heard the term the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Go ye therefore, preach, teach, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Friends, that's the Great Commission. That's what the Lord has commissioned 
you and I to do to go, to preach, to teach, to tell somebody about Jesus. But 51% of America's churchgoers has never heard of the Great Commission. Number 23. 51% of Americans, listen, say the Bible was written for each person to interpret take it as he or she pleases to do so. Boy, that gives us a right to take every scripture we choose to take out of context, out of context, doesn't it? That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. The Bible says this book is of no private interpretation. And one of the greatest Bible teachers that I ever sat under was named Gordon Pittman. I'm sure that Gordon's in heaven now. But I loved old Gordon. In fact, if y'all remember back in the 80s, I had him here to preach. But Gordon Pittman said this. He said to us Bible students back when I had dark hair a long time ago. He said, boys, he said this book that I'm trying to teach you a little more about says what it means and it means what it says. And he said, don't any for he said, don't for any reason, under any circumstances, ever take a scripture out of the context that it's written in. Because in the context is the message and it tells you what it means. I heard one preacher say, you can make make it look like the disciples rode a Honda all over everywhere they went. And everywhere they went, they were in one accord. Boy, that's bad, isn't it? They were in one accord because they were like-minded. And I had another preacher say one time, I can take and show you where they rode motorcycles. Of course, they were all kidding. David's triumph was known all over Israel. Y'all remember the motorcycle, the triumph? You got one, haven't you? I thought so. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, listen, you've got to, 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 to interpret the Scriptures according to what the Scriptures say. Okay, now let's continue. Number 24, listen to this. I have on the right number, right? Number 24. 70% of unchurched people, this breaks my heart. 70% of unchurched people have never been invited to church in their whole lives. 70% they've never been invited to church in their entire lives. Just across the street, we got some new neighbors. I visited with them twice already. Talked with them. Even bought a little cup of lemonade from one of their sweet little young ones last Wednesday night. Drove around the block whenever my wife said they were selling lemonade. And that was the sweetest lemonade. <laughs> I couldn't even drink it. But I won't never tell them that. You see, little things like that might be what it takes to bring somebody like that into church. And the, the guy's a Marine veteran over there. And I thanked him for his service. Always invite somebody to church. Man, it's sad that there's people in this world that's never been invited to church. Amen. That breaks my heart. And listen, I know that we all have our, our, our little places that we like to sit. But if you get here and somebody's in your seat, don't ask them to move. My 
goodness. One Sunday I'm going to come in here and I won't be able to preach a lick because y'all all, all going to move around on me and I won't know where. <laughs> My goodness, Dennis not here today. Oh yeah, preach I'm back here. Boy, I, I mean, don't make a bit of difference where you sit. But do you know there's actually people who's been to churches and, and, and they were welcome to church and this is the way they were welcomed. We're glad to have you with us today. And oh, by the way, you're in my seat. <laughs> Would you come back? Think about that. Number 25, listen. 65% of American churches have a weekly attendance. Listen. 65% now of American churches have a weekly attendance of less than 100 people including the children. Including the children. Boy, that speaks to where we are, don't it? Speaks to where a lot of churches are. That's why we're in the mess that we're in. Because people have refused to go to the house of God. Number 26. Listen to this. 46% of evangelists agree that God accepts the worship of all religions. Boy, I could preach there for a little while. But I don't need to say no more. Because we know that's not true. Why in the world is our country that was founded and based on this book that I hold in my hand trying to make us believe that there's so many avenues to heaven. Why? Help me understand that. I, I just don't understand that. There's one way. One door. Jesus is the way. He is the door. <laughs> a couple of years ago, Marta and I were, were blessed to go to uh, Kentucky to see the replication of Noah's Ark. Boy, that's something to see. It's really something to see. But you know what impressed me the most about the ark? The rep replication of the ark. You know what impressed me the most? That door that was on the side. Whenever you stood inside that ark and looked at it, that door, you know what you could see? A cross. A cross. Jesus is the door. He's the only door. I can't believe that there are those evangelical Christians that's trying to tell us that Allah is the same God that we serve. I struggle with that. And they're trying to push that down our children's throats in schools and everywhere else. I struggle with that. We'll leave that one right there, okay? Number 27. Listen to this. 51% of churchgoers don't believe that sharing their faith is essential as an obligation of their Christian faith. Boy, that blowed the Great Commission out of the water, didn't it? Jesus didn't say go if you want to. He said go and tell. Number 28. Am I still on track with my numbers? 77% of all Americans believe that personal salvation is a result of their good works. 77%. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any should boast. 77% of people who call themselves Christians, they think that heaven's going to be their home, and heaven's not going to be their home because they think that their works is going to get them there, and works won't get you anywhere. It'll make you feel good about yourself. Make you kind of flap your lapels a little bit and say, Woo, look what I've done. That's why the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Everybody likes a little pat on the back every now and then. But it's not them pat on the backs that's going to get us anywhere. It's grace through faith that's going to get us everywhere. And I'm not trying to belittle works because I believe in works. Because I've been talking to you about works. Go, tell, share. That's works. Do it. But you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what He's done. You're not saved by what you do. But you do because you are saved. You see, Baptist folk, we good to quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of work, lest any should boast. And, but hey, let's, let's look at verse 10. For you are His workmanship, Ephesians 2, 10. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Friends, works will follow true salvation. Amen. You want to do something. I like that. We was talking about music a little bit this morning, and I listen. I, I don't want anybody to think that I don't like music, I, because I do. Sometimes it speaks to your soul. I just basically said some people like entertainment more than they do worship, and God wants us to worship through our music and the Word. Uh, and I shared with you, I like entertainment. Hey, my brother back there likes it too. He's going next week to the National Quartet Convention. Hey, that's great. You tell my buddies the kingdom heirs, I said hello. That's great. That's wonderful. But let me just say this. While music is good, the Bible says it's the preaching of the Word that'll save our soul. Whenever I begin to think that there are people that think that they can work their way into heaven, it, it's sad. If we could work our way there, why did Jesus die? Why did He die on the cross of Calvary if we can work our way to heaven? We don't work to get to heaven. We don't work to get saved. But we do work because we are saved. All right, number 29, listen to this. Nearly half of young evangelists from ages 18 to 29 favor same-sex marriage. Abomination. Abomination, that's what the Word of God says. That may be why we're in the mess that we're in. I don't need you. Nearly half of young evangelists, 18 to 29, favor same sex marriage. All right. Don't need to say no more to that one because we know what the Bible says about that. Number 30. Y'all didn't think we was going to get there, did you? <laughs> Listen to this. More than 30% of churchgoers say that they've never felt God's presence during a service. Now every now and then, i got to confess to you, even an old fella like me, it'll jump over me. Amen. And I can't help it. 
And I just can't help it at all. It just gets all over me. I heard about an old evangelist from days gone by. I knew him. He's with the Lord now. His son is an evangelist now. And uh, he told his son, he said, I preached for seven years and never felt the presence of the Lord. For seven years. And he said, his son said to him, well, Daddy, how did you do it? He said, I was just faithful. He said, I knew what I needed to do. And he said, I was just faithful. Striving and seeking and praying. Trying to pray through. Trying to search my life to see what it was that caused me not to feel the presence of God for, for so long. Y'all know what the number seven means in the Bible? That number seven means complete. He said the seventh year because of my faithfulness to preach the Word, He said, God gloriously let me feel His presence again. Sometimes it's not easy. I know what it is to, to long to feel the presence of God. I prayed prayers in my ministry that I felt like didn't get above the ceiling. And I've tried to be faithful. But how sad it is that 30% of people who go to church say that they've never felt God in a service. Maybe it's time for the church to wake up! Is our churches so dead that you can't feel the presence of God in them? Oh, God help us! Number 31. 70% of all young people who grow up in church usually, listen to this now, usually leave the church by their 20s. Did you catch that? That's sad, isn't it? Vera said I was one of them. Seventy percent. Seventy percent of our young people who's been churched. I think our convention is living proof of that. You go to any Southern Baptist convention meeting anywhere you want to, and I'm just going to tell, tell it like it is. You're going to see a lot of white-headed people. But you're not going to see very many young people. But there's a remnant, praise God. There's a remnant. Number 32. 65% of all Christians believe there's multiple pathways to heaven. 65% of people who call themselves Christians believe that there are multiple pathways to heaven. I remind you again of my friend that I do business with from time to time. 
in Tifton. I've told you the story. You've heard it 10 million times probably, but sometimes it'd be a good place to ingest injected into the message right here again just to remind you. I walked into his place of business one time and he let me know. Remember the First Baptist Church of Tifton, Georgia. My friend, Dr. Chess Smith, was his pastor during this time. So I know that he was getting the infallible truth of the Word of God because Dr. Chess <laughs> preached the truth. But let me tell you something. My friend, who was a member of the First Baptist Church of Tifton, said that they had had some people from different cultures that had joined their church. And said, we were sitting in Sunday school class the other day and said, do you know that one of them got to talking to me about what they really believed? And, and said, I've come to the conclusion uh, that there's more than one way to get to heaven, Brother Danny. And I believe that. And then I told you he made his mistake. Y'all remember that? He made his mistake and he says, don't you? <laughs> I said, no, I don't. Because the Bible says, I didn't say Danny said, I said the Bible says, there's one way. And Jesus is that way. The only way. But 65% of all Christians or people that call themselves Christians believe that there are multiple ways to heaven. Number 33. 30% of all Americans believe after they die that God's going to give them a second chance. Now don't misunderstand me when I say this. We serve a God who is a God of a second chance and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, and an eighth, and a ninth, and a tenth. You know how I know that? Amen. But when you close your eyes in death, it's over. You've made your decision. You've either chosen to accept His forgiveness and grace, or you've chosen not to. And yet, people still try to blame everything on God. I still have people to this day to say to me, Preacher, do you think a loving God would send anybody to hell? And I always answer that like this, Oh no. We go to hell because we chose not to follow that loving God. And that usually causes things to get really quiet. Because of our own unbelief. That's why. And that brings me to point number 34. Oh. Mm. So many of them I can't keep up with. Them. That same group that believes this that I've just said to you, that there are multiple ways to heaven and Second chances after you leave this world believe that there is no hell. Now boy, that's sad, isn't it? There is no hell. I'd like to sit down with one of them and say, well, do you believe in heaven? I wonder how many of them say, oh yes, I believe in heaven. Well, you can't have heaven without hell. The hell wasn't prepared for any of you, I'm glad to say. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, those that followed him. But hear me when I say this. The gates of hell's doors are broadening and getting wider and wider because more and more people are going there because they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And they die and go there because of their own unbelief. And then, Number 35. Boy, y'all been waiting to hear that one a long time. <laughs> In just eight years. Listen now. In just eight years, the percentage of the United States population calling themselves Christians 
it's decreased from 78% to 70%. think about that for just a little bit. We're on a decline. 78%. 78% has declined to 70%. We're on a decline. The Bible says and Jesus says and He teaches us that in the last days that there would basically be a great falling away of the people and we're seeing that now. That was one of the signs that we talked about last week in our sermon, Signs of the End Time. That's where we are. We're living in these times. Friends, I had already prepared something else to preach to you today. But whenever I found this material, it broke my heart. And the Lord spoke to my heart just as clearly and said to me, Son, that's why y'all are in the mess that you're in. We've turned away from the true and the living God and we're trying to make everything that He said to us in the pages of this precious book a lie, but it's not a lie. It's the truth. So I close by saying this to you. We need a God sent, earth shaking, heaven filled, Holy Ghost revival in the United States of America. And it could start right here stand with me if you will father i've given to your people that that you have trusted to me use it for your glory now in jesus name amen